G'day, g'day, and welcome to Tartarian Truthers with your hosts, Casey and Jojo. We are back after taking a short break, but we hope you enjoyed our little bonus features that we left while we were away. Yes, we didn't want to leave you hanging for a month, so we thought we'd leave you some tasty little tidbits to tide you over. Yes, and Casey, you know what? I really enjoyed that last episode on Fort Macquarie that you did, uncovering some really interesting facts of that site. Mm, it's fascinating, isn't it? Really, It really is, and I really hope that people go, if you haven't had a chance to go watch that one, go watch it. Go watch it. Such a good one. Thank you. But now, before we get started, we just want to thank the incredible Campbell over at Autodidactic Channel. He's been sharing some of our episodes on Telegram and gave us a shout out on one of his lives and it has really helped our channel grow and really for so many more of you to find us. So a big thank you, Campbell. We are huge fans of yours and your work has been a big part of our inspiration to start this channel. Sure has. Thank you so much, Campbell. You're a bloody legend. You are, mate. You are, but thank you. Okay. So. All right. So now today we're going to delve into the topic of mud floods and how we think they pertain to Australian history and architecture. So first up, what is a mud flood? The mud flood theory is an observational explanation for a variety of perceived flaws in historical records, including ideas regarding Tartaria as an empire and attributing these flaws to a global deluge of mud that caused cities and lands to sink into the earth and a consequent rewriting of history by various political and religious authorities over the past 200 years. Oh. Mm. Buildings hundreds of years old and located all across the world are known to be encased in a mud flow up to several stories high and in some cases even completely engulfing buildings entirely. You can find buildings that have an age of only a few hundred years old and find them buried in mud. The windows and doors of the upper floors of buildings are quite often found to be at ground level and occasionally even found to be completely buried underneath the surface of the mud that covered the entire area. What? You're thinking no way, right? Sounds crazy, doesn't it? Like how? How could that even happen? It does. It sounds ridiculous. But... It could have been caused by something called soil liquefaction. So soil liquefaction occurs when a saturated or partially saturated soil substantially loses strength and stiffness in response to an applied stress, such as shaking during an earthquake or other sudden change in stress condition, in which material that is ordinarily a solid behaves like a liquid. In soil mechanics, the term liquefied was first used by Alan Hazen in reference to the 1918 failure of the Calaveras Dam in California. He described the mechanism of flow liquefaction of the embankment dam as, if the pressure of the water in in the pores is great enough to carry all the load, it will have the effect of holding the particles apart and of producing a condition that is practically equivalent to that of quicksand. Mm. The initial movement of some part of the material might result in accumulating pressure, first on one point and then on another, successively as the early points of concentration were liquefied. Oh, Mm, that's really interesting, isn't it? It is. So, you know what, for more of a visual explanation... Let's watch this short news clip from a few years ago after the earthquake in Christchurch, New Zealand. 
Archaeologists claim that much of the damage that's been caused across Christchurch has been caused by a phenomenon called liquefaction. A couple of days ago, we had never heard of that term, but everyone speaks about liquefaction, and indeed, you can see it everywhere around you, because this quake was relatively shallow, just five kilometres below sea level, and uh, what it's mean, what it's meant really is that a lot of that soil has turned to mud. Carl Eberly has the details on the story. In just moments, roads turn to quicksand, swallowing cars and swamping suburbs. Oh, it was straight up to the earthquake, mate. That was frightful. This process, called liquefaction, has left much of the city a soggy, crumbled mess. But the, the liquefaction, I mean, the, 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 the suburban streets are like rivets. You see these ladies over here. Uh, they're just sinking. The silty, saturated layers of soil just below Christchurch were so severely shaken, they liquefied. And with much of the city built on soft earth, seismologists believe the phenomena has heightened the devastation. Mate, it was frightful. <laughs> <laughs> you know, not to make light of it, it would have been frightful, I'm sure. It was. And, you know, so what do you think caused this mud flood to happen? Well, well, nobody knows for sure, but of course there are theories. Was it a huge and powerful electrical surge, a direct energy weapon of sorts, a solar flare, or multiple simulated quakes or explosions all over the world? You know, we don't know. Nobody does. But we all have the same consensus that it was probably a planned attack of sorts. By who, we don't know. But we suspect that whoever it was or whatever they were or are, are still running the show today. So when did this happen? Some theorise that it could have been as little as 150 years ago, give or take 50 years. It's hard to know as our timeline has been changed and altered so much that we don't even know what year it really is right now. Nope. Nope. And, and so we're told it's 2021 and that's what we believe. But who really knows? All we know is that there is some pretty hardcore evidence that Australia was at one point in fairly recent history mud flooded. Let's take a look. <laughs> As you just saw, we had some incredible infrastructure, huge buildings, multiple stories, yet we still had dirt roads or sometimes just straight up mud. And then we start to notice something really quite bizarre. Buildings with windows and floors built at ground level or below. So there are some old buildings that go four or more stories below the ground. So here we have the Chief Secretary's building in Sydney, said to have been built in 1878. As you can see, it is built below ground level, as well as many stories above. Quite a feat for its year of construction, with none of the modern machinery that we have today to dig out huge portions of the ground. Not to mention that when we were doing our research for this episode, we discovered that a tunnel goes from the eastern side of the Chief Secretary's building on Macquarie Street underneath what is now the Carhill Expressway to the Conservatorium of Music, which apparently used to be the government stables. They say large carriages and horses would be stored there after dropping off passengers 
and the tunnel was built for the drivers to come and go. The reason for the tunnel was that in those days, the dyes in their red jackets were not very colour fast, if you can believe that. <laughs> the red in the, in the rain would run down into their white pants. <laughs> <laughs> Lackly story. Like, can you imagine the person who came up with that idea? So, unfortunately, the driver's pants are turning pink from all the rain we've been having lately. So uh, what we've decided to do is dig huge tunnels under the city so that they can stay out of the rain and keep their white pants pristine. Uh, uh, excuse me, sir. What if we just changed the driver's pants to black instead? Oh, what on earth? My goodness, man, are you daft? That is simply preposterous. You nincompoop, get out of here. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, it's such a stupid I'm, story. I love these cool stories, you know, like, and the thing is we believed it. I know. Oh, such goodness. a tall tale. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right, so then there's also a secret tunnel which goes from the balcony of Henry Parks, who is known as the father of Federation, his original office in the Chief Secretary's building on Macquarie Street, goes down to Level 1 and under Bridge Street across to the building across the road, which was originally the Treasury building. Seriously, who was digging these huge tunnels and how? (laughs) Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So let me go to this right image now. Mm -hmm. So um, you can see here with the Burns and Philp building, also in Sydney, that is built in a similar way. It has a basement, ground level, mezzanine level, and three upper levels and was built in just one year from 1899 to 1900. Incredible, right? We thought so too. So incredible, seriously. Anyway, we decided to send Jojo off into Sydney on an assignment to see what other mud flooded buildings she could find. And she found out a lot. Check this out. Jojo, that was amazing. And how incredible is some of the old world architecture in Sydney? It is so beautiful and so mud flooded. Mm -hmm. How many floors underground is the QVB? Do we know exactly? You know what? We don't know. And I mean, I would speculate there are many, many more floors below the floors that we know of. Wow. Okay. But who to know? With all these tunnels underground, who is even to know? Yeah, and there's so much more. Yeah, sorry. I was just going to say there's so much more about QVB that you didn't even get to cover in your bonus feature. We just scratched the surface. That's right. Like, Stay tuned for a, a 
part two QVB bonus feature by Jojo because <laughs> there's so much more to that building that is so strange. I know, it's very odd. Mm. You know, there was one thing that I didn't really like about doing my little tour mm. was when I was uh, walking by Town Hall, the magnificent Town Hall in Sydney, mm. being used as a clinic. Ah, uh, yes. What kind of abomination? Like, you know, anyway, seriously, yes. Such a beautiful old world architecture for mm, being used for that. Mm, mm. Mm, for that purpose, yep. All right, well, let's move along. Okay, so now next up, we had a comment from Nip News on YouTube, and it made us want to dig a little deeper into it into this hidden history of underground Ballarat. So thanks to Nip News, you're a legend. And an excerpt from his message another fact about the streets of Ballarat I find fascinating is that many of the old buildings current street level is actually the second or third stories there are parts of the city underground at the original street level that you can walk along though authorities won't allow it passing original storefronts and all blows my mind Okay, so here's an article that we found from The Courier. It's called Discovering Ballarat's Forgotten Underground History. So there's a few interesting points in this article. Um, in the second paragraph here, it says, In the darkness under the street, cellars, tunnels, bakeries and buried shop fronts, possibly even a restaurant, lie dormant. So the courier went and took a tour underneath Ballarat this week and discovered a forgotten world that many have heard about but few have seen. Jill Blee, president of the Ballarat Mechanics Institute, said the lost shop fronts were always slightly underground but were accessible from street level by a set of stairs which led to a lower Sturt Street. Ms Blee also pointed out old stairs which led to existing businesses on ground level. There are plans to put a restaurant down here but we can't be sure if it ever happened, she said. But we do know there was a number of businesses down here. That's odd. Why, why doesn't she know if it happened? If she can go down there and look, wouldn't she be able to just see if there's a restaurant down there? Strange. Anyway, ghost tour operator and history buff Nathaniel Buchanan said he was organising an underground tour of Ballarat in time for Heritage Weekend next year. So Nathaniel's obviously been down there. Couldn't he tell us if there's a restaurant down there or not? Anyway, he said that Lydiard Street's level has risen by three metres in some sections and parts of Sturt Street have risen too. Ballarat was full of hills and cliffs and they decided to make it flat by using the byproduct from the gold mines, but the buildings were already there, so parts of them are now underground. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Mate. <laughs> anyway, Mr Buchanan said the old shop fronts beneath the Mechanics Institute, the bakery under Reed's guest house in Lydiard Street North and various cellars under hotels were highlights of Ballarat's underground history. He said a dungeon beneath the University of Ballarat's SMB campus library was also of note. It's surprising how many Ballarat residents have no clue about what's underground here, he said. Then down here, Andrew Wallace of Ballarat Historical Society, he's actually the president, he said that the existence of Ballarat's underground architecture was known, but there was no published list or catalogue of below ground structures. Why on earth not? Wouldn't this be absolutely fascinating and interesting and wouldn't you want to do as much research and excavation as possible to find out exactly what's down there? All seems very odd to me. So odd. So, like, I wonder how many other cities and towns all over Australia have hidden underground architecture like Ballarat. Mm. You know, either long forgotten or purposely hidden and covered up so as to not encourage prying eyes and uncomfortable questions. You just don't know, do you? Mm. No, we don't. And, you know, now some of you might still not be buying into this whole mud flood theory, and, and that's okay. But to put it into a bit of perspective, let's take a look at this time lapse of a basement. Actually, a basement works in Pitt Street, Sydney, which was carried out by a highly skilled civil engineering company. Look at the huge machines. The time and the effort that it takes to build a basement today 
and this is with all our modern technology and access to skilled civil engineers. And imagine the months of planning that went into this before the project even started. It beggars belief that this kind of construction project could have been done in the 1800s, in the timeframes that we've been given, and with the primitive tools and scarce labour force that was available. So perhaps there is something to this mud flood theory after all. What if a mud flood wiped out an entire generation of people? What if all that remained were mud flooded buildings damaged by some kind of event? What if cities or even entire countries were then repopulated with new people whose job it was to dig out the buildings, fix the damage and start over again? A reset, so to speak. What if they were then taught a new history, indoctrinated to believe and do as their masters, the government, told them? and continue to live, work, and reproduce, with their offspring also being indoctrinated with the new history. So it was no longer new. It just was. Hmm. So on that note, we will leave you here to ponder upon that theory, and you can come up with your own conclusion or may or may not have happened in the not-so-distant past. But... We will delve a little deeper into this theory in our next episode, where we'll be taking a look at the history of orphanages, asylums, jails, and female factories in Australia. You won't want to miss this one. No, it's going to be a good one. It's going to be very interesting. So, yeah, thank you for listening, guys. Yeah, we, that's the end of the episode. That yeah. was a quick one, Casey. It was. It oh, really awesome. was. Awesome. Thank you, everybody, for watching again. And please, if you like the content, like, share, and subscribe. Bye. See you next time, Casey. See you, Jojo. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>